Good evening, one. Good evening, all. What a pleasure, what a joy to meet with you one more time in studying God's word about prayer. Why don't we begin with a word of prayer? Let us pray, Heavenly Father, we bless you and we thank you for this opportunity to continue our series on prayer. May you be with us and empower us in the name of Jesus. Amen. In our last message, we talked about family worship, and we learned that family worship has at least four crucial activities, praise, prayer, Bible study, and testimony, and that all these elements must come together under Christ. We also learned that family worship helps the family to signify the daily consecration to the Lord. It help, also helps the family signify their moral perfection that they aspire to reach every day. Now, I, I remember a question yesterday about um, being using devotionals in family worship. Um, devotionals are not bad in themselves. The point I was trying to make yesterday is that we have to make family worship interesting and varied. We, shouldn't, we don't have to follow one specific pattern all the time for so many years. The key is to make it interesting, whether we use a devotional or not, we have to be able to lift Jesus Christ. And if the devotional is a means to that end, praise the Lord. The problem is that sometimes we confuse the means with the end, and that includes the devotionals. It also includes prayer. It also includes Bible study. It also includes testimony, because all these things are not end in and by themselves. They are means to an end, and that end is Christ-likeness. As long as your devotional or your family worship makes Christ the first and last and lifts the hearts to Jesus Christ, there is nothing wrong with anything you, you do. But remember, varying methodologies. The message of the hour is entitled, A Caring Church in Changing Times. A Caring Church in Changing Times. And the question I was tasked to address in this message is how to form a prayer group. A prayer group is important. In fact, Ellen White encourages believers to form groups to pray together for specific purposes. But often, we may not be able to know how to do that. In this message, we will begin answering that question, hoping that you will continue your research in seeking ways and means to form meaningful prayer groups. Now, there is something that happened for the past year and a half. It's called COVID. COVID-19 has affected almost every aspect of human life, including worship, including prayer, including serving God. And the idea of forming prayer groups in the midst of such a pandemic makes it complicated. But anyways, God always has a word for every season. Even in the context of a pandemic, with all its implications like social distancing, there is still a way to come together and seek for the Lord. And this week of prayer is one example of that. Now, coming together to pray is very important, as I said earlier. It's a must. No one is an island, and that includes in prayer life. We become stronger when we pray together. It is true that more prayer brings more power but more prayer together brings more power together. So we must be able as believers in Jesus Christ to lead through prayer in groups, to have, to form groups together. It's a mandate, by the way, 
Jesus Christ himself understood it. Although he was God, all powerful God, all sufficient God, he needed the disciples to pray with him. In fact, many times he is recorded pulling them together aside for prayer. So forming prayer groups is part of the gospel package. Now, the idea that we are in a pandemic has been turned into an excuse for many people not to pray and even not to think about praying together. But we are going to see that this is not an excuse. And this is the point I want to make. In everything that we do as a church, we need to be caring. We need to be caring. I think that's one key element that is lacking in most of our churches today. But the question, therefore, is what is a caring church? Because a caring church will be a praying church. In the book of Acts 4.32, the Bible says that the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Take note of three things there. Number one, they believed. They believed means that they had a personal commitment to Jesus Christ. And that personal commitment to Jesus Christ was a shared commitment. And because they believed in Jesus and they were committed to Jesus, they were one heart and one soul. That's the second thing. The third is that they had all things in common. That's the picture of the church in Acts. And from these three elements, I want to draw three lessons. Number one, a caring church is a converted church. That's why it is said of the believers that they, they believed. Belief has to do with conversion. They were converted, genuinely converted. Number two, a caring church is a united church. They were one heart and one soul. Number three, a caring church is a sharing church. They had all things in common. Until a church is converted, united, and sharing, you cannot talk of a caring church. And if that church is not caring, there is no way you can have prayer groups. So the key to having good prayer groups, meaningful prayer groups, is not to have people come together to pray. Remember in the last message, we we saw the disciples asking Jesus to teach them to pray. Not that they didn't pray before. They used to pray, but they didn't pray like Jesus was praying. And because they didn't have that kind of prayer life throughout the Gospels, you can see the divisions, the tensions, the uncaring relationship they have towards one another. So until a group of people really genuinely care for each other, there is no way we can have a meaningful group of believers talk less about a meaningful prayer group. The key element to a prayer group, a meaningful prayer, prayer group, is a genuine caring group of people who really care for one another. And they will care if they are converted, if they are united, and if they are sharing. Commenting on the life of the early church, one philosopher wrote this. It is incredible to see the fervor with which the people of that religion help each other in their wants. They spare nothing. Their first legislator, that is Jesus, has put it into their heads that they are all brethren. And this is the key. You see, the key 
to a meaningful Christian life, a meaningful church life, is relationships. And this Jesus taught us in his answer to the, to the quest, to request, teach us to pray. If your father, if your friend, Jesus focuses on relationships. And the disciples didn't experience the fervor of prayer until they realized that they were brothers and sisters of the same father, of the same savior. The problem in the church is that most of the times we are not brothers. We are just acquaintances in the church. And that's the foundational element towards forming a prayer group. Now, a church is caring. Watch me here. A church is caring because church members are caring. A church keyboard is not caring. A church building is not caring. A church pulpit is not caring. A church report is not caring. What is caring in the church is the church members, the people that compose the church. And many times we have delegated church to the buildings, to the keyboards, to the pulpit, to the reports, instead of being the church. And you can have all the prayers that you want together until that is not there. There will be no genuine power in your prayer life, and there will be no genuine meaningful group of prayer. So we have to be caring. And the people that compose the church are the people that should learn, that should be caring towards one another. Which also means that a church is all caring because all church members are caring. In some places, you have some church members that are caring. It is good, but not enough. We need all of us to be involved in the lives of one another. We need to love one another genuinely. You see, it is when we love one another genuinely that we become true disciples of Jesus. And that prayer will take all its meaning and power among us. A caring church is a praying church, not a praying church, P-R-E-Y-N-G. You see, when you study the Gospels, you see the disciples fighting for supremacy like Lucifer. You see the disciples having issues with one another, and even with Jesus Christ himself. You see them not being able to pray as long as he wanted them to pray. You see them scared in the storm on the, on, on, on the, on the lake. You see them having all kinds of issues among themselves, being suspicious of one another. You see them fighting against one another. Even though they were praying P-R-A-Y-N-G, they were doing it by praying against each other P-R-E-Y-I-N-G. You see, sometimes we as people of God, we behave like wolves. Can you sit with a wolf and develop a relationship with him? You can do that with a lamb, but not with a wolf. And that's the foundational issue that we must address to my understanding today. I have to learn to love and care for the people around me in the church. And you see, when you care and you genuinely care, people will feel it, people will know it, and it will be easier for you to bring them together and form a group of prayer. And there are many groups of prayer that start well, and they don't end well. And the reason being is that they were not, they didn't start from the right foot. You see, when you don't understand prayer, and prayer for you is about yourself, as we studied last time, that prayer group cannot last long. If at the center of that prayer group is not Jesus, there is no way that prayer group can last as you want. 
If a prayer group comes together just to ask for healing mercies and food and, and degrees and, 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 and money and, and jobs and, and all these important but not so essential things, that prayer group will not last long. The disciples understood it. And in the book of Acts 1, you see them coming together and focusing on Jesus, focusing on one, uh, one another, focusing on their mission, and looking forward to the coming, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. When the church understands the true nature of prayer, who should be at the center of prayer, you will see those small groups springing coming out like mushrooms everywhere, which means that if you don't have prayer groups, and if even if you have them and they don't last long, they don't have an impact, that's a symptom of a deeper sickness. And the deeper sickness is that we don't genuinely care for one another. And that applies to the home too, the husband and the wife. They are the first prayer band. But unfortunately, there are husbands who cannot pray with their wives. There are wives who cannot pray with their husbands. I, I, I don't, I, some, of the, some of them are pastors. Some of them are elders, but they can't pray. They go out to the church and they pray so well, but at home they can't. At home, they cannot pray with their children and the children cannot pray with their parents. That's not God's standard because when we genuinely care, for one another, we will pray together and groups of prayers will just spring and multiply. An uncaring church is a COVIDic church. As I told you, sometimes I use words that are not in the dictionary yet. So don't quote me in your essay, dear students, saying I used COVIDic, but that's a word that makes sense to me. You see, when we spend time gossiping, how can two people who gossip against each other have a meaningful prayer life? I'm not saying that they cannot pray together. We come together and we pray in the church as leaders, as members, as whatever we are in the church. We pray. In fact, every Sabbath, every Wednesday, every Vespers, we come together to pray. But where is the power? The power is not there because like the Pharisees of old, in our prayers, Christ is not the center. God is not the center. We are. And we are at the center of our prayers because we feel sometimes so self-righteous like the Pharisees and that as we pray with other people, they are the wicked ones. We don't genuinely care for them, for their welfare. We just accomplish a task. It's a kind of transaction that we have amongst ourselves. There is no prayer band that can stand the test of time if it is based on a transaction and not on a relationship. An uncaring church is a COVIDic church. There is one thing that we have to think about though, and I hope that this idea will revolutionize your thinking. And most importantly, it will revolutionize your prayer life. Sometimes we confuse process and product. There is a process before you have a product. For example, not to be sexist, because I understand now in this 21st century that you have to be very careful with your choice of words. But we understand each other. We are the church. Now, in the mall or the gross, at the grocery store, you see a woman buying groceries. That's part of a process. It is not the product yet because the product is something else. She is at the grocery store because she has a goal. After the grocery stores, the next step is to go to the kitchen. And in the kitchen, she will cut all those ingredients, pull them together and prepare so that we can have the product, which is a delicious meal. So when you see something good somewhere, do not only focus on the product. 
think about the process. How did this thing come to be? And this is what I would like us to do now. So, and the, the question I ask myself is, what happened before? What happened before? You see, in Acts 4, 31 and 32, you have the caring church. And that caring church is a product. And that product means that something happened before. What happened before? A changed church in Acts 2, 1 and 2, when the Holy Spirit descended on the church individually and in the group. That presence of the Holy Spirit made the whole difference. But the question still stands, what happened before? Before then, in Acts 1, 14, you have the penitent church, the church that is repentant. So you cannot have a caring church if you don't have a change or a transformed church. And you can have a transformed church if you don't have a penitent church. And yet what happened before? Before you had a struggling church. In Luke 22, 24, this is one example in the gospel where Jesus is about to leave and he's about to leave and give them the, the Lord's Supper. And the Bible says that right there before the Lord's Supper, the disciples were fighting, asking among themselves, who will be number one? So in the Gospels, you see a struggling church, but you cannot have a caring church without having a transformed church. You can't have a changed church if you don't have a penitent church. You can't have a penitent church if you don't have a struggling church. So as you think about the product, you want to see a vibrant prayer band. That's the final product you want to see. Remember that it takes a process. Don't be seeing take time to be holy. Yes, before a caring church is a changed church. Before a changed church is a penitent church. Before a penitent church is a struggling church. Yet the question still stands, what happened before? And this is the secret. What happened before is Christ. Christ ministered to the struggling church in the Gospels. Christ ministered to the penitent church in Acts 1.14. Christ ministered to the changed church through the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.1 and 2. Christ ministered to the caring church in Acts 4.31 and 32. Brethren, I want to shout. I want to stand. I want to scream it. The secret to a mighty powerful prayer band is Jesus Christ. When we allow Jesus to minister to us as we struggle, as we struggle to become penitent, as we struggle to become penitent, then transformed, as we struggle to be penitent, transformed, and then caring, we allow Jesus Christ to work his will among us. That is how we can have a wonderful prayer band. That's the key. That's the secret. So to be caring God's way, the church must be Christ-centered in everything. And this is the greatest challenge. Because we have all kinds of distractions, all kinds of opinions, all kinds of things that hinder us from experiencing that powerful, powerful, powerful prayer life that Jesus has in store for us. So until Jesus is the center of everything, no prayer group can stand the test of time. And I want you to remember that there is a time to struggle. It is part of the gospel package, but many people give up in the struggling stage. So when you will start your prayer band, you will have some issues. You will have some members who cannot cope with the, with the pace. You might have some people who will give up on the way. You don't have to win everybody on board. Try your best to get as many people as you can on board, but don't let the, the, those who give up let you give in 
to that great idea. You have to persevere and go through the process. Allow yourselves to be cooked by the fire of the Holy Spirit, to be molded, to be made through the, the, the power and the working and the ministry of the Holy Spirit so that in the, when the time comes, you will reap what you have sown. Sometimes I tell people, it took Jesus 30 years of preparation to train a class of 12 students for three and a half years, and yet one failed. In fact, all of them failed at Gethsemane. And yet Jesus never stopped. Jesus kept on. So you don't become a prayer warrior overnight. You don't have a prayer band overnight. It takes time. And as you take time, it is important to be very well organized to have your goals, because most of the time, sometimes, I won't say most of the time, when we come together, if we don't come together for selfish interest, we come together for other issues. You know, sometimes people say, let's pray together, but genuinely, they are not seeking for Christ. They are not seeking for the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They have all kinds of divergent interests. They come together to pray because they have their own needs. They have their own agenda, but they don't have God's agenda. So if you want a meaningful prayer life as a group, you need to find God's agenda for that group. Christ had an agenda for the 12, and he fulfilled it. It took him three and a half years. And some of us, we don't have the patience after one or two trials, after one or two weeks, we give up. Jesus didn't give up on his prayer band. He stayed, he stayed with them until they became what he wanted them to be. But mind you, he did it knowing that he was fulfilling God's will and plan for his life. So as we contemplate on creating or forming prayer bands, we need to think about it. What is God's plan for our band? I'd like to shift now to one more question, and that has to do with church caring killers. There are things that kill church care. Number one, you have criticism. Now, I'm not talking about positive criticism, like you want to rebuke your brother and let him know that he's on the wrong and he should go to the right. I'm talking about bitter criticism, things that we say against and about each other just to hurt. You also have indifference. You see, somebody said that the opposite of, of love is not hatred, but indifference. You also have contempt. When you have people who have contempt for one another, that's a church caring killer. You have dishonesty. You see, dishonesty is a church caring killer. You have defensiveness. There are people who are always in the defensive. That's not good in the realm of church caring. You have stonewalling. Stonewalling has to do with ignoring people and, and not avoiding them like you want to walk by the wall just for you not to mingle with them. That's a church caring killer. You also have disrespect and so many other things. Should I talk about sexual misconduct? Should I talk about lies? Should I talk about gossip? Should I talk about witchcraft? Should I talk about in, impatience and, or, and quick temper? All these things are church caring killers. And when we entertain them in the group, there is no way we can experience the power that God has in store for us in our prayer life. And the greatest of all church caring killers is self. The greatest competitor to Jesus is not Satan, it is self. But when self is surrendered to Jesus, and when self is surrendered to Jesus by all prayer band members, oh, what a blessing, what a bliss, what an opportunity. And because of self, we end up being sad Adventists. Sad Adventists are Adventists who are sad all the time. They can put up a face on Sabbath morning. They can put up a face with the brethren here and there, but deep within themselves, they feel miserable because they don't enjoy the very things they teach and preach to people. I don't want to be a Adventist. 
I want to be a happy Adventist, a genuine Adventist, someone who has a strong relationship with Jesus Christ, someone who has a passion for prayer, someone who has a passion for people and who can come together and pray. And let me tell you, sometimes also what things, one thing that kills prayer bands is that everybody wants to be the leader. You know, most of the time when people think about starting a prayer band, they are thinking of being the leader. You don't have to be there for the prayer band to work well. Take your time, take your place, take your space, and let God lead out and let him take all the glory. Let him be the center. If you don't do it, you will try and you will end up a sad ventist. And this statement by Ellen White always strikes me very deep. She says, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. I know we use this in the context of evangelism that is reaching to non-believers, but believe me, there are non-believers in the church. And even if they are believers, they are people. And if you want to reach people, we need to use the only, the one and only method that gives true success. And what is that method? The savior, number one, mingled with men, desiring their good. Number two, showed his sympathy for them. Number three, ministered to their needs. Number four, won their confidence. And five, then, only then, he bade them follow me. You see, the problem in our relationships is that we skip one, two, maybe we use three, we skip four, and then we want five. Follow me. That's not how it works. Do I genuinely desire the good of my brother? You see, that's where the caring element comes into play. Do I really care about my brother or my sister I want to pray with? Or do I just need that person to come and feel the numbers so I can boast of having a prayer man? Do I genuinely desire their good or do I want my good through them? That's the first step. And that's where most of us fail and most of our plans fail. When we mingle with them, we must desire their good. And desire is good, but not enough. That desire has to be translated into tangible behavior. We show them sympathy. And when we show them sympathy, we minister to their needs. We win their confidence. And then we can come together as a prayer bound and serve God. A caring church is Christ-centered, not self-centered. And that's the key. That's the key. Make Jesus the center. And in such a place, people have a passion for Christ and a passion for souls. And that's what we need. That's what we need. When that happens, you will see mighty things happening when you come together and pray. Now remember that in this, there is a context. Ellen White says about the end times that there are forces now ready and only waiting the divine permission to spread desolation everywhere. You see the world as it is? You have not seen anything yet. In fact, Matthew 24 talks about the beginning of sorrows. Can you imagine that we are only in the beginning of sorrows? Let me tell you, the world is in trouble for one reason. And I discovered this during the pandemic. It's in Romans 8, 22, verses, verse 22 and 18. You see, Paul in verse 22 says, we know, we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. You see, Paul compares the sufferings of the earth, the sufferings of the world to a woman in labors ready to give birth. So the question is, what baby is the world going to give birth to? The answer is in verse 18 of Romans 8. The creation. Oh, 
Lord, help me here. The creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Friends, the church is the reason for the season. You are the reason for the season. The baby that is coming out of all these troubles that the world is going through is the church. The church vibrant, the church militant, the church triumphant, the church in which companies of believers will come together, form prayer bands to the glory of God and for the good of humanity. In other words, a caring church is a missionary church. So when we want to come together, do we understand why we come together? Do we really mean business? Are we in tune with the mind of God? God has a missionary one mindset. God has a caring mindset. And this is why he wants all of us as his children to have the same mindset so that we come together. Remember in Acts, the church cared for one another. They came together, they prayed together and they went out and spread the good news. That is the reason why we come together as a church. Not just to ask things of God, but to ask the will of God to be fulfilled in our lives. Until this is done, I guarantee you there is no way, no way anybody, any group can experience genuine prayer, genuine meaningful prayer life as a group. The multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Acts 4, 32. May God help us, help us go back on our knees from today, from this moment. Not just jump into the program and say, I want to form a prayer band but go on our knees and connect with Christ and seek his will and watch him perform wonders for us. God richly, abundantly bless all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.